Welcome to the Crit House, everybody. That was the work of Lee Cott, the work that we're going to discuss here on the Crit House today. And we are honored with two returning reviewers onto the Crit House, Suzanne Ravy, who is a photographer and an educator. She is an adjunct professor at Clark University, and she is on the board of the Photographic Resource Center here in the Boston area. And she is a big presence in the photographic community in New England. Suzanne, Suzanne thank you for, uh, for joining us here on the Crit House. Thank you. It's my pleasure. And honored once again to have with us, most of you, many of you may know, Alex Kilby. He is a professional photographer in England. And I think uh, I think most of you probably know of his program, The Photographic Eye, here on YouTube. Very popular. The Photographic Eye is a great resource for, uh, for learning about photography, for photographers, technique and inspiration and history. Um, Alex, how's it? How's it? <laughs> how's, it, how's it, Jeff? Um, and nice to meet you, Suzanne and Lee. Looking forward to this. You know, before I introduce Lee, let me just say one of the great things about what we're trying to do on the Crit House is to make it so that people can come and learn how to talk about photography, to sort of bounce their ideas and hear other people's opinions about the work. Um, and one of the one of the options that uh, that can be done is I know that, uh, Alex, you do consulting and let people come and talk to you and you help them with their photography. And I would I would like to encourage like anybody to find somebody to talk to. If it's not a, a critique group, just find a person they can do, whether that's Alex or Suzanne. It's just it's a great resource to learn more about your photography. Um, so please, pl pl thank you for watching The Crit House to learn some about that. But um, if you have that option to talk to somebody like uh, Alex or Suzanne, please do that. Lee Cott, my friend, is here joining us. He spent his entire career working as an architect and has uh, since retired. He was, uh, he was, by the way, a quite successful architect by most measures. Uh, he studied at Pratt Institute and at Harvard, and uh, he was later a professor at Harvard. Um, in his retirement, he has turned his eye to photography, and he has done some impressive work. Lee, tell us about the, uh, the project we're going to talk about today and what it is you're looking to learn from Alex and Suzanne. Very good. Well, thank you, Jeff, and thank you for having me. And Alex and Suzanne, thank you for being here as well. <clears throat> um, since I left my architectural practice, my act architectural practice um, actively, uh, I've since uh, begun photographing uh, areas around Boston and Cambridge. And an area which has fascinated me for some years now is this area in North Cambridge, uh, where originally these three high-rise towers were built. But then with the advent of this big parking garage and major transit stop, a lot of the former industrial land in this part of Cambridge has been rezoned for housing. And so we find new housing being built here, which is adjacent to railroad tracks, uh, adjacent to a highway overpass bridge, adjacent to a highway, and all that separates it is um, a sidewalk. These are photographs that you're looking at now of, of, of the original housing development these three towers but this is an electrical substation which is pretty well surrounded as you can see by new housing overlooking the substation uh, there are other kinds of issues involved with uh, yards for storing materials uh, that are adjacent to housing uh, and although this doesn't look like the greatest place for me that i would want to be as a resident uh, it does offer i think some good opportunities for a photographer and so I'm drawn to these kinds of land uses and these kinds of incongruities in the landscape that I think are interesting. And, but I seek really to do photograph them in ways that are visually arresting. And so my questions for, for, for you this morning uh, is, do you think my message about the incongruity of these land uses comes across in these images? Uh, if so, how might I make it stronger? Uh, do you find the images themselves to be compelling as art, if you will? And if this does become a project, and I'm thinking that it will be possibly a book of some sort, uh, do you think it might be expandable into other places that have similar issues? So Alex, Suzanne, dive in what do you think yeah um uh lee thank you i think first of all for, for sharing them um i did look at these uh, briefly earlier um, and, and thank you for filling in you know a bit of of your you know methodology behind them you know what what the project is um in in answer to one of your questions which was um yes incongruity um it's it's hard to say really um that 
I'm not really getting like a, a, a cohesive message from the whole thing. Um, and I, I think if you, if you were to sort of break it down into a documentary sort of idea, you'd like to have a beginning and a middle and an end. You, you said that, you know, those, those um, three tower blocks were the, uh, the thing that drew you to the area originally. And if I was following you correctly, that was kind of the first development there. With your with the project as a whole, I think you want to kind of use them as a focal point and expand slightly outward there, because what I'm sort of see with with these as as they are now is simply a collection of um, urban urban landscapes. Probably is you know way of looking at it. Um, I'm sort of thinking, are you familiar with with Robert Adams? I'd imagine you are. Yes. Yeah. So if you think about his work you know so certainly the stuff with you know with the tracked housing and, and what have you that's that's i think where you'd like to sort of move towards is trying to get not necessarily obviously the tracked housing and, and and stuff but the effect of this this urbanization this this urban yeah urbanization um of of the area um, and 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 sort of make it a bit more pronounced in your photography. Make make a bit more use of of juxtaposition. Um, you know, you said like with, the, with what was the one with the um uh, the substation? Like like here, there's a substation. There was another one. Um, I think uh, yeah, like here. Mm -hmm. With this particular photograph, it's hard to tell that's a substation, right? especially from from where I'm sort of sitting. Um, but think about how you can make the the connection between the two of them, the substation and the the you know the, the residential housing stronger, you know like like here. Uh, sorry, if you go back to that one, Jeff. Thanks. Yep. Um, like here, you've got you know, obviously some housing and then the the trash and all the stuff at the back. So that's a bit more sort of on top of each other. Can I just yeah, jump yeah, in absolutely. with a thought? Um, sure. One thing that when I looked through these, and I thought this one was particularly strong, and I, I realized that the ones that have telephone poles in them, I think you define the space, somehow having a vertical element helps sort of create this dimensionality. So, you know, there's housing, there's trash, there's the phone, a parking space, you know, and it also reminds me, I know we mentioned Robert Adams, who this uh, certainly has some bearing with, but also Lee Friedlander, who I think was really marvelous at using telephone poles um, in places. And, and so it struck me that the pictures that have the most kind of visual structure to me are the ones that do have some kind of vertical element like that um, in them, I'm trying to think. And, and I also wonder if I know this area, I just drove through here yesterday, I drive through here almost, <laughs> all the time right and so i understand what i'm looking at maybe a little better um so i don't know if that's um uh a good thing or a bad thing you know if somebody's not familiar with this area yeah you see i like the telephone pole here um there's something about to me you're getting a little bit more at the incongruity of what you were talking about with this yeah you know, and so um, the other thing is, and I realize that you're not including people, and I know that your work doesn't really feature people, but I am kind of curious about those folks who do live around here, you know, I mean, would you expand the project to include some portraiture and maybe, you know, try and find people who live in those towers or or who live in, you know, the smaller houses, you know, I know there's a kind of a neighborhood behind those buildings where the picket fences are, Um you know, would you would you consider adding portraiture? You know, that's one way to think about it, like the use, the space that people are in and how they use it. Um, you know, that's one one thought um, yeah. that that strikes me. But um, but I don't know if you're interested in in pulling it towards portraits and landscape like this. Lee, what's your thought about that? Well, I mean, I've, I, you're not the first person to have mentioned this, Suzanne, but it's mm -hmm. it's not primary in my mind i'm really interested more in the, the build the build part of it the landscape right right it's juxtapositions but no it's a, it is a thought it's it's not a place that people are, are out and about very much oddly enough as you can right. imagine uh, there aren't any parks except in the, the very back area 
uh, people scurry back and forth to the train stop. Um, and the few times that I've been photographing where there have been people, they're making sure, sure to get out of the way. And in fact, in a couple of times, as you probably know, I've, I, I've motioned to them and know they don't want to be photographed. Alex, let me just say that the genesis for this project was indeed Robert Adams. Uh, was it? His, okay. Yeah. His work in the new topographics and a big show that, that, that's on at the National Gallery in Washington uh, was how all of this originated. Um, okay, lovely. I, I, yeah. I really sort of see this as a second generation of development, whereas what Robert Adams sure. was photographing was a first generation, right? So yeah, when I, I first... Think... Go ahead, sorry, Alex, yeah. Alex. Sorry. No, go ahead. Um, I was going to say, yes. I mean, because uh, obviously when I drew the parallel with, with Robert Adams, you know, one of his things is there was nothing there. So it's the, it's the placement of man's structure on top of, you know, nature, mm -hmm. whereas this is man, up to, uh, man upon man. Going back to, to, to Adams, I think one of the things certainly that struck me when I first looked at your, your images is that <clears throat> some of them, and you made reference to landscape, um, some of them feel, excuse me, um, a little bit like you're just taking a photograph of just things. Like, like this image, for example, if you go back one, Jeff, 19, yep. Yep. right? So this here is <clears throat> I get there's a substation there and there's a parking lot and there's this new house that it looks like housing um but th this photograph doesn't really have any to me any sort of structure whereas if Jeff if you go up to I think there's kind of like seven or eight um up a couple more um no further up number five it's number five um, no, it's not number five. <laughs> I'm talking nonsense. Um, I just go up a couple more. There's one right at the beginning. There, number two, number two. <clears throat> right. Um, that's one. So, like here, for example, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm, I'm having a frog in the throat day. Um, I like the crosswalk stuff. You know, there's a nice, sort of strong sort of element. And if you, I think, make a slightly stronger composition that you're bringing in, you know, the, the tower blocks and, and what have you then these start to feel like certainly from my perspective that you are at least taking the time to i think to also channel into your background as an architect you know showing these buildings i think you know how they they fit into the landscape how you know the landscape can be molded around them visually to to make the image just feel a little bit more cohesive um, I don't personally mind the lack of people. I mean, you know, would, how does that sort of feel? Does that, does that feel like a fair, a fair observation? Yes, it does. I think that uh, in this one particular photograph, I think it does show <clears throat> the way the buildings are sort of molded into the landscape, don't you? Um, I do. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I have one other thought on, if I may, I, I think the, uh, I, I think you should pay maybe a little bit closer attention to where you're placing the horizon because they're all very central. And I think um, you might move it down or move it up from time to time. This one works for some reason. It, that, that's not to say you can't put one yeah. in the center. Um, and my other question to you is one thing that I uh, strikes me, and if you don't have the catalog for that Robert Adams show, I recommend you pick it up because it's fabulous. I have it at home, yes, big fat yeah. catalog. Um, one thing that I, has always struck me about Robert Adams pictures is that he always uses really harsh light. And I think he's being critical. And I think he uses that harsh light to sort of align with his message. And um, I'm seeing lots of different light here. I mean, you're here on stormy kind of overcast days, or this sort of looks like kind of late afternoon. Um, actually, I do see your shadow in this one. So there's one person there. But um, <laughs> uh, um, I, I would pay attention to light. So how can you use light to that might help you um, make it more cohesive? You know, if you look at the Bechers, right, they always use flat light, right? It was always kind of an F8 light. And I do kind of like these dramatic clouds, you know, so I, I just think you need to think about, should, should you keep up with dramatic stormy clouds or like Robert Adams, maybe stick with the harsher sunlight? You know, I think that's a question of um, what your intention is and where you want the work to go. But I would, I would pay attention to um, the types of light that you're using. 
Yeah, I, I agree with that. Thank you. Well, Thank so you. so Lee, on, along that line, so what what is it? I mean, I what are you trying to communicate? Are you kind of trying to communicate something that's like ominous about the area in general? Does the so is having that sort of dramatic sky something that you should do, or is it? What, what do you think in that that would, direction you would go with it? With that? Um, no, it's more physically environmental as opposed to the sky and 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 the, and the weather condition. I do tend to go out early in the morning when I find the light to be most beautiful. Uh, some of these have been obviously in stormy days. Um, and I agree with you, uh, Suzanne, about the Beshers and photographing always in an even light. And that had to do a lot with their wanting to have the series look very consistent. Yeah. And that is something which which disturbs me. I love the light here, for example. Um, it's very early in the morning. It's a very calm sky, good, strong shadows from the structures. Um, there's a beauty to this beyond the obvious terror of these cars 15 feet away from a, sort of a, a housing development. But uh, I, the, the fact that the light is uneven throughout the series does disturb me. Mm. So I, you can just I, to I interrupt really you there me. for a second, Lee. Um, if you go back one, Jeff, to the cars, yes, right? Now you made a point, you, you talked about there's, a, there's a, a, a main road, so 15, 20 feet from a housing block. Route right? two. Now, is that part of, is that sort of like, <clears throat> like an anti-town planning thing, or is that just bad planning, or what, what's the story there? Well, I mean, I would consider it bad planning. Um, okay. I don't think this area has ever really been master planned in a meaningful kind okay. of thoughtful way. Because just the, re the reason I ask is that I always, when, you know, when I talk to people, often they have a broad idea, but the focus is lacking a little bit. And obviously you have a, a very knowledgeable background about these kind of things. Um, and maybe that would be something to give you a little bit more cohesiveness is finding mistakes, as it were. Yeah, rather than just kind of what it feels like is sort of slightly more sort of randomly walking around. Does that, does that how does that sound? Well, it sounds great. I mean, this this looks like a mistake in a way, a, a, an intentional mistake. Yeah. Nobody would normally do that, uh, but it's pretty amazing. I yeah. think this is one of the best pictures, by the way. I think this one's really good. Like you place that arrow in just the right spot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that, that's yeah, that that's the sort of thing. Because yeah, it just it, I think once you tap into something that's more natural for you, you know then it starts giving your work a little bit more of a soul. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You, so, yeah, yeah. I, I think have a look at it because you might start to find these things all over the place. And at least then, yeah, it's sort of coming along. But uh, do, you, uh, do you shoot film or digital? These are digital. These are digital. I, I did uh, buy a Holga camera <clears throat> and went up there a few weeks ago with film. Because I wanted okay. to make some messier photographs. The, the reason I ask is that they are, you know, Suzanne was talking about the light earlier, and they do have a fairly flat feel to them, you know, across all the processing, um, which is not necessarily a bad thing. Is that a conscious decision? No. No. So they, yeah, this is. This. I think I, I think they would work a little better with a little bit more depth, you know. And I don't know um, if you've ever tackled photography with a four by five camera, but this might be something to do with larger format too. You could try, but I realize that's um, adds a, a kind of a lot of other ways to think about it. But um, yeah. you know, it could be done that way. Yeah, it's just because I, 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 you know, I'm sort of looking at certainly the, the the ones where the buildings are more the star of the show than the, you know, the, the juxtaposition, what have you, um, and and it, I, I think some of these buildings really lend themselves to a more punchy kind of look. But it, you know, it's, again, it's you have to bear in mind with these things as we've talked a lot about consistency throughout the whole whole project. But um, yeah, I just wondered if it was a. a um, you know, a, a, a definite choice that you'd made. So one of the things I thought of when I first saw this was, uh, and Lee, we uh, talked about this uh, before too, is that uh, 
the, when when Adams was doing his projects, it was about man encroaching on nature and society kind of encroaching on nature. This is a little bit of the opposite in that um, these housing projects, the ones we're looking at here, they're encroaching on the infrastructure. You know, the infrastructure has been built, the train lines, the roads and everything else. And, and, and the <laughs> world is trying to move into this space that doesn't have enough space. So it's like you're being jammed into a, a tiny area. You know, the train tracks are there, Route 2 is there, and the, the, all this housing around is being built, um, trying to fit into an infrastructure that's required. I mean, you have to get people around. You need to have power. You need to have uh, plumbing and sewage and all these yeah. things. <clears throat> people are trying to fit around this this space where there's really not enough room. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, think, I think this communicates this pretty well for me. I've just, I just had a thought as you were talking about that, Jeff, and this is why these, these sort of sessions are so useful. Um, are you familiar with, are you guys familiar with that uh, Walker Evans picture of like the houses and then there's the graveyard and yeah. then the, the picket mm -hmm. fence, right? So the whole thing's flat, it's like on a flat plane. And as Jeff was talking about <clears throat> the encroachment, I, I thought in my head, you know, a lot of these pictures that you're showing us here, Lee, are let's say three quarter right so they've got some perspective and some depth to them but what if you photographed everything on a flat plane right so you have everything you know so like a building perpendicular also parallel to the to the film plane mm -hmm. and then the next layer and the next layer, because that might send you give the sense of everything being jammed up together so feel like that. but if you look at this there feels like there's some depth but if what happens if you compressed everything together you know you've got the suzanne's telephone pole <laughs> you've got the, the summer shack <laughs> in the background and stuff like that and then there's this this high rise behind and if that high rise filled the frame might you know is that a direction that might sort of go okay we, we're now starting to really make a play of this fact that everything is jammed together where there isn't the space. Yes, I think that's a very good observation. Yeah, I think to, to achieve that, you could sort of try and truncate them with a longer lens, you know, and see mm. if that um, does that for you. You know, mm. think about Saul Leiter and how he kind of truncated the city, mm -hmm. you know, um, and spaces and... No, those are good comments. That, I like that. that. That might be kind of an interesting thing to experiment with. Yeah. yeah, and 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 this this particular building here, the, the one that drew you to, I'm thinking of like, um, oh, uh, John Mayowitz's um, Empire, you know, with the Empire States and in, in back of the images and stuff. If that building, whatever it's called, were in there somehow, again, it just get, it gives it a little bit more sort of you know cohesiveness. But yeah. Well, Lee, you have. Uh... There's a lot to talk about, uh, yeah. and a lot to think about here for you. And what I think is a fa I, I think this project is fascinating. I'm, a, I'm, you know, this is I'm like Suzanne, and that I have driven past this location time and time again. So seeing it from your viewpoint is uh, is fascinating. And that to me. parking structure, you know, you could try and do a little bit more in the parking structure. I always feel like whenever I leave my car there, it's I feel like I'm lucky. It's still it's not collapsed yet. <laughs> <laughs> it has it has come close to collapsing on a couple of occasions. It's, it's been held up by a bunch of work. holes inside. <laughs> well, Lee, um, it'll be interesting to see where you where you take the project, and I appreciate you showing it to us here on the uh, on the Crit House. Thank you so much. Um, I want to thank you all for participating, Alex Kilby and the Photographic Eye. Um, great program. If uh, you viewers have not seen it, it's really something that you should take a look at. Uh, Suzanne. Ravy um, for joining us here again. Thank you so much uh, for joining us on the Crit House. And I do want to say that I am going to be linking up to a couple of videos, or at least one video uh, of uh, of Alex's, uh, the photographer who made fa buildings famous. That's uh, Ezra Stoller, who, uh, who uh, took a look at photography um, and is a uh, an acquaintance of uh, Lee Cott as well. Thank you all for joining us on the Crit House. <laughs>